This is Popping the Bubble with hosts Sandra Ponce de Leon and Pete A. Turner. Hey, this is Jeremiah Ao Yang, and I'm on Popping the Bubble. You said you're a spy. I feel like I'm being interrogated. No, no, no. <laughs> it's way worse. Do we got to do a polygraph? <laughs> no. <laughs> Polygraphs suck, by the way. You don't just, oh, those things are terrible. They're not valid? No, they're valid. It is gut wrenching. You're nervous. Mind heavy work. Yeah. And then, like, just the questions. And then you're trying to be calm because you don't want to so give. So you've actually undergone. Polygraphs. Yeah, it's oh, sucks. horrible. I've been, I've been tased because you have to go through it to understand what you're putting. Have you been waterboarded? Through. I've not been waterboarded, but I, I would. I mean, if that was part of the job. And waterboarding, I'm sure, sucks because I've seen horrible things that wouldn't fall under the term torture. They, they don't leave any marks. They're in stress position. Just like yeah. mind, mind, mind fucks. Well, mind fucks are one thing, but I'm talking about physical discomfort. Oh, where where you're just like, I would like to make this discomfort stop. I'm not like talking pain. Sitting in a weird like going, going, going yeah, stuff like a this. lot of things, and nothing oh. I'm going to talk about with the thing recording. So <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you off. My- Hey, Jeremiah. Hey. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to have you here. Yes, it's fantastic. Pleasure. Actually, we're here in your house. <laughs> thank yeah, you thanks for, for hosting us. us. Thanks for coming down you. to sunny Silicon Valley. We're right in the middle. Like, So we're right in the middle of Box, Tesla, and Facebook, and their employees like live in this neighborhood, and it's quite a wild ride. Amazing. A lot of nerds. Do you track them down and, and uh, interview them? Oh, it's so easy to find them. They've always got their heads down. They're hunting Pokemons. <laughs> Do you guys Pokemon here? Oh. Where's your jiggly? I, I need Jigglypuff bad. <laughs> <laughs> so Jeremiah, we have known each other for a really long time, and yeah. um, you have been a very prominent expert on the web and on futuristic uh, trends. Thanks. Uh, now the CEO of Crowd Companies, which is a consortium of Fortune 100 brands. Uh, yes, it is to learn about new emerging technologies. But um, I know you've actually recently been on a quite a health kick, and I've seen you participating oh, in thanks. all of these races. Seen you getting buff. So tell us what's what what what's that all about? Well, thank you. That's very nice coming from you. So there's three things I'm trying to balance in life: it's fitness, family, and being a founder. So I kind of have those things in, in in balance. And so I recently turned 40, and I made a commitment: it's time to get healthy because you know I'm getting older. So I decided uh, with what helps to my friend, like uh, Ernest, who works at Apple, started to do obstacle course races. So last month I finished Tough Mudder, and that was the hardest physical thing I ever did. It took six months to train, to 10 months, and then the race itself up in Tahoe took six hours to finish, but I did it. So wow. Congratulations. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, that's amazing. And cool. you've felt quite a difference. Oh, from yeah. This it's new- great. And if anybody wants to try out obstacle course racing it's a full body workout it's like a military stuff you know it's kind of like the things you did in, sure. in the army it's sure. very similar they try to model after those things yeah yeah i noticed a lot of those obstacles are involve face down in mud crawling because that's just so debasing you've got to want to do that to do that in your spare time <laughs> <laughs> by the way i don't practice that in the backyard <laughs> <laughs> not when you just get to and do yeah yeah, but there's only one way to do that well, and that's just a Superman dive. Boom, get down in it. Because if you try to stay clean, it's not going to no, work. No, don't, don't, do, don't be clean. So, yeah, and it's a good metaphor for um, I want to be uncomfortable because I want to always be ready for what's next. And the types of companies I work with, these big, large corporations, the biggest in the world, I want them to be uncomfortable with all the changes that are coming up from technology. And I think that's what we're going to talk about here in the show. And that's right. That's right. And keeping on that theme of companies being uncomfortable or rather getting disrupted by new technologies. Is that really what you, is that what crowd companies is about? It is. So when I look at my my career uh, path, it's always been helping large companies with new technologies so they can connect to their customers. And that's what I've been writing about on my blog, uh, Web Strategist, for over 10 years now. And I've written mm-hmm. about almost almost 3,000 blog posts that's on amazing. that topic. Wow. Mm-hmm. So that, that's my passion. And so crowd companies is a consortium, as you said. It's a club for corporate executives who really want to understand new uh, business models. And the topics that we've been focusing on have been the collaborative economy. And then also Which the... Which is really a term that you coined. Actually, there was others before me, so okay. I'm not going to claim All credit. Right. But I'd like to give you credit. Thank you. You're, you're, you're very <laughs> kind. Uh, and then we also started covering the autonomous world, which we can talk about these robots mm-hmm. that are taking human jobs, gasp. And then there's new things that are coming after that. So we can talk about all those phases. Right. So many amazing things to talk about. What I love about your perspective is it always comes through very optimistically. I feel like 
you know, I, I look forward to that utopia, that world where we're getting driven around in our autonomous vehicles and able to just kick back and read a book. <laughs> you know, it's almost, it is, feels like it's practically here because if you take an Uber, sometimes you don't even know that that human driver, un- unfortunately, is right in front of you because like you just fall into your, your mobile device. So we're being already trained and groomed for robots to serve us. It's already starting to happen. And, and you talked about robots taking over jobs, but we've got to get over that. We've constantly evolved into new jobs, new things. I mean, we went from wandering around finding food to agriculture, you know, and that allowed people to do other things. Next thing you know, people are painting on cave walls and then there's an Eiffel Tower and all the things that... Wow, we went from cave tower to Eiffel Tower. It's a short show. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But uh, if you can have some kind of automation that serves you to free your time up, We've proven that we've always adapted to find new new ways to do beautiful things or find new harder stuff to do. That's right. And so humans just keep on evolving. On Reddit yesterday, there was this picture of these two uh, gals. They had these giant um, calipers, and they were basically grabbing ice blocks and bringing them to people's homes. And I was like, yeah, that job existed 100 years ago. But then fridges and freezers came around. So it's a, it's a nonstop thing, like, and we're always going to evolve. Yeah, uh, we had a guest on before, Sean Ryan, and he talked about a number where, like, in 19... 19- the 1910s, 90% of us did an agricultural-based job, you know, mm-hmm. and now you go 100 years later and only 10% of us I do that. I think it's even less than that, 2 or 3%, yeah, It was right? a yeah. tiny percentage, tiny right, mm-hmm. but a, a huge... It shifts. Like, we're speaking Americans. So. We're talking Americans, yes. right, yeah, but that stuff bleeds out from, from uh, the innovation that happens here. You said something, too. I kind of wanted to go back and echo it. You talked about making companies uncomfortable with the change that's coming. I work in a cultural space when I do my things. Mm-hmm. And if there is a lack of comfort, that means you're outside of your normal cultural zone. And that's how you grow. Yes. Mm. How does, uh, I'm looking at the collaborative economy, honey, uh, economy honeycomb. Can you explain what I'm looking sure. at? Sure. And for those that are listening in, if you could just go do a Google search, collaborative economy honeycomb, you're going to find one of three infographics that I created working with a group of people. And essentially what I wanted to do is chart out all of the startups that are enabling peer-to-peer services. And you've heard of these like Uber and Airbnb, but there's also the maker movement where people create their own goods or people are lending each other money in Lending Club or Prosper. And then we that was the first wave that we saw. And now we're seeing it advance into services where people can come to your house and clean things or uh, Sandra and I were talking about people can park your car for you there's even a new I love it I love that service (laughs) there's there's so many services out there Uh, but we're even seeing it in the luxury space uh, where in the beauty space where somebody or that the salon can come to you and can give you a makeover at your house or we're seeing that Rolex watches are available on demand from peers as well so it's in really every area of society and that's kind of this big trend that we are tracking, this collaborative economy. That's what we call it. I'm still waiting for my coffee on demand. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's quite possible because we saw that Starbucks and Lyft partnered last year. So mm-hmm. we should expect oh. to see models like that emerge. Have and a drone with sure. your coffee out the window. Like, thank you, drone. Yep. <laughs> yeah. your coffee. I mean, that is the, the, the real future that is coming. Uh, ben Metcalf, who we both know, spotted a, a food delivery drone in South Park in San Francisco wow. yesterday. And he asked what? me, who do you know is doing this? And I said, well, Walmart's trying this. Amazon's trying this. Pizza Hut is trying this. Domino's is trying this. Like it could be any of those companies. That is a, a soon to be reality. If, if there but, are thousands of companies that are going to be doing this in the next, say, 15 years, we'll just go that far out, probably mm-hmm. less than that. Is there, how do you link all the technology together so you don't have drone chaos 15 feet in the air above us? I mean, I, if you yeah. remember, like when word processing came out and you wanted to print, it was havoc. You know, when you had to have the right word processing program because it wasn't just standards. Word. Right. Yeah, 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 exactly. What do, what do we do about that? Well, so let's segment, um, let's segment into real three, three ways to look at this. There's aerial drones. There's um, physical drones that drive themselves like these little robots delivering pizzas. And then there's self-driving cars. Mm-hmm. Let's segment them because okay. they're regulated in different ways. Okay. So for aerial FAAs, pretty much shut down a lot of opportunities. There's not a lot that is allowed to be done for obvious reasons. And United States is very paranoid about uh, aerial threats. So let's just leave it at that. Uh, Self-driving cars, it can be tested in, I think, five or six states. California is one of them, Florida, and obviously Detroit, uh, Michigan. And so that's being tested. And then um, these other drones that will move around neighborhoods, I don't know if that's being regulated at all. So that's the different styles that we're seeing in the flavors. When are we going to see autonomous cars that will be accessible to the public? Mm -hmm. 2020, 
to 2022. So today's 2016. So in four to five years. And I was at the Detroit Auto Show in January this year. And just about every single car manufacturer announced that they will have it. And cars are on a five-year production cycle. So they're coming soon. Wow. I was in a, uh, a town in Iraq, Mosul. And we were talking and interviewing with all kinds of Iraqis. And we had interpreters that were locals. And they were very smart engineers, trained in London. And we had a conversation one day. This is 2004. And the guy said, this this self-driving robot car thing is it's impossible i'm an engineer there's no way to make this work and literally like that week darpa had that contest where cars and they were going like four miles an hour and running into stuff and they weren't very good but look 10 years later 12 years later this here we we're, are. Yeah, we're millions of miles driven now with cars that can do it on their own. And you can see them even, you know, in Silicon Valley with the uh, the Google self driving car. I, I see it on a regular basis. So mm-hmm. it's you haven't been in one yet. I've been in uh, the Tesla. I've been okay. in Loic Lemire's Tesla. Mm-hmm. So we've experienced some of that. Uh, but I've not been in the new Google, the Panda cars. Mm. So I need to go do that. Is there any marketplace for a smaller scale vehicle that maybe even works in the pedestrian space? Uh, a coffee cart that's maybe, you know, five by five by five. Mm-hmm. And it just goes around and just does a neighborhood. And you just have one one droid per that That I'm mile. sure is going to be worked on, but I think they're going to focus on people. But when you look at the Google one, it only sits two people. So that mm-hmm. is already pretty small. Yeah. So once that starts to merge, that will be pretty commonplace yeah because there's no reason why you couldn't have an automated barista that just did a route you know i like how you're still thinking about my on-demand coffee i'm I'm trying to help you out i like to keep (laughs) sandra happy that really is my mission it's a lot easier on everybody there's going to be so many business models so think about retail when you're shopping basically the store is going to come to you and all the goods are going to be in the car and you just look at it in front of your house uh, we're going to see people own vehicles even less and less. We're already seeing that in urban areas because of Uber and Lyft and on-demand cars like Zipcar to relay rides to get around. But now you can summon these self-driving cars. The other business models for those that have aging parents or you yourself might be in retirement. This is such a wonderful opportunity for us to stay mobile in our later years. We don't have to depend on somebody to get around. It also means that medications and first responders can come to us a little bit faster. Meds can come to us and, and lots of services can just come to us on demand. So there's lots of opportunities. But I think the the downsides, and we need to look at all the sides here, is that uh, professional drivers, that will soon be an anachronism. That's Mm -hmm. not going to be a job class of note. They'll still exist. I had a conversation today with my co-host from the Break It Down show, John. We talked about the last diamond record that was sold, you know, 10 million copies sold. And, and what was it? It, it was, um, I think Adele is the most recent one, but it's Adele and then it's Sync in 2000. In, wow, that's a big, like... 20, 30 year. Yeah. Break. Like it, it's wow. over. There are no more 10 million sales. There's going to be a couple here and there that just cross multiple uh, charts and gets there, but it's, it's the long tail uh, and it's not albums. It's single songs. Mm-hmm. You know, the market has to adapt. So drivers, there's always going to be a need for drivers that have to handle hazardous waste. We're probably not going to trust that to robot for quite a while. I don't know. You maybe know? that might be better in that scenario. That could be better. Well, I but think- it's like having a BART train. You wouldn't need a conductor on a BART train. But there's a lot of human lives on it. So you need that fail safe of I'm going to make sure this thing works all right. If you've got some kind of petrochemical rolling bomb, Mm. we're likely to want some kind of fail safe in there. But yeah, if you're just moving corn, why not have that have that done autonomously? Yeah. Um, Yeah, you were talking about all the opportunities, but there's obviously going to be a lot of disruption to a lot of different areas um, such as transportation mm-hmm. um, and retail. What, what are other, some of the other um, areas? So we're talking about the autonomous world. So transportation will certainly be hit first yep. um, and, and professional drivers will be hit first. But let's look broader. In the overall autonomous world trend where robots do things better than humans, any repetitive position that humans do, any repetitive task is going to go to robots. And the White House released a report early this year. This is from you know President Obama. And they referenced a research that was done. So if you make less than $20 an hour as an American, 83%, 83% chance that your job is going to be outsourced to robots. Mm-hmm. Hmm. If you make wow. 20 to $40 an hour, one third chance your job will be outsourced to robots. I think that's the majority of Americans. Yeah. yeah. Well, I saw you had put a question out recently on Facebook asking what 
jobs will be automated? What were there any that which will not be automated? Yeah, would not which be jobs will not be replaced by automation? And the answers that I heard um, were things related to the arts, mm. um, the arts, creativity, storytelling, writers, people that soothe others, healers, massage. Uh, folks, dancers, and then a few a few positions of ill refute as well. Uh, but essentially, the, you know, the human to human type of, of things, uh, teachers, parents, those things will still remain human. So that begs a really big question is what are, what are humans going to do if, if robots are taking a lot of jobs in the next few years? And it really depends do you have a pessimistic or optimistic view of the world? And what, how about you guys? Are you pessimist or optimist? I'm pragmatist. Okay. Generally optimistic, but sometimes, I mean, recently I've been a little down with <laughs> the current <laughs> climate. <let's> okay. Say. <laughs> Stop reading politics. Stop, yeah. Stop reading Facebook. Po- yeah, start reading post. Facebook. <laughs> I play Pokemon instead. You're going to have a balance of both things. You know, yeah, a, a, sure. a lot of those jobs will go away, but a lot of the jobs will still be there. Maintaining things, maintaining the things, the robots and the, Absolutely. the droids. Someone has to do that or at least design how it happens. If, if something happens in your house, you're going to have a handyman show up. That's too individualized of a task to do to scale it to a, a robot, I would think. Well, let's see. That's not a repetitive task. Fixing right, my banister, that's true. so that's right. that doesn't really fit under that that thing. But you think about a lot of production jobs, manufacturing, fast food, bank tellers. Mm-hmm. Um, there are some things that people that is not what they really wanted to do in life. The process of writing a AP stories, if they aren't already, there's going to be automation for that. You know, so many words, so many paragraphs, story curve, a, yeah, right. Mm-hmm. And then. Could we go to the point of saying TV writing for shows, since shows are so formulaic and it's on the actor? I, I can't imagine we'll replace actors, but the script itself is, I mean, look, yep. I can tell you what happens in every Three's Company episode, every Chip episode, every episode. The reason why I don't watch, yourself. what's that? I said you're dating All yourself. All right, well, then I said, I'll do this. <laughs> Kardashian, sorry. Any episode of Big Bang Theory, I already know the jokes. I already know what's going to happen. And the show's wonderful. Uh, but before it's watching it, you're saying you can predict what's going to happen? Yeah, I mean, every, every show has the same pattern. Yeah, so there are patterns, and they know what humans are doing, so those things can be automated. And there was recently um, an app where a robot was creating art, and people could not tell the difference. Sure. So it is quite possible mm-hmm. that a lot of these things, through pattern analysis of what humans like, that could be replicated. So when you looked at the discussion that was happening on, on my thread, just about everything could be uh, replaced. Except for your mom and dad. Yeah, except for your mom. <laughs> well, no, that's not quite yeah, true. Yeah, that's true. Right? It's getting there, yeah. yeah I mean, I'm going to 3D print you. Yeah. So <laughs> the question is... What what can humans do? What do humans really want to do? What will humans be doing? Yeah, if it, everything is automated. Is there higher order things that we could be doing? Could we all just be hanging out and creating podcasts and yeah. and um, and hanging out in the sun? Could humans go to a, a higher phase on Maslow's pyramid if the bottom phases are taken care of? Well, and and nobody grows up and says, you know what I want to do? I want to make sure I file off the plastic tabs when we print out a a, a lattice for the gardens. I want to do that all day long. Mm-hmm. Just file, file, file. Like no one says that. They say something creative. You know, I, I talk to people all the time that want to write the book. And I'm like, well, write the book. But in the meantime, let's do a podcast. Let's get it done. You know, those things, you can pursue those things more if you're not filing plastic off of a lattice somewhere. That's right. So the, the way that we will see humans uh, behave will change. Now, there's a second follow-up question is this, is how are people going to get food? Mm. How are people going to get rent? And yeah. the discussion that's being had amongst people in this space is this is not a political, a partisan play on either way, but is providing a guaranteed income to all of these individuals. Have you heard of universal right. basic sure. income? Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. And that's being pushed. Um, it's being talked about both on the left and the right. And even from the tech entrepreneurs who are going to be producing these robots, they want it too. Because if you don't provide income to people and everybody devolves, you're going to have a revolt. And guess who they're going to come after? Stops. <laughs> yeah. Right. The one percent. <laughs> they're going to come after the one percenters. Yeah. Right. Going back to automated, uh, tra- going back to automated transportation, Sandra and I were just talking about. So we have, we have this desire to be more like Europe and have uh, fast trains that take people places. But it almost seems like that idea is, is becoming passe. Why would you spend multi-billions of dollars to put people on a train when 
they can turn an app on and be in a car and gone. We have a different infrastructure here in the U.S., right? We have for, for sure. Especially in the Western, the great Western states are a lot bigger. Yeah. Well, that I mean, when you look, I was just interviewing um, the CEO of Hyperloop at, at oh, BMW. Cool. At Hyper, at, there's two Hyperloop companies, by the way. There's Hyperloop One, and then there's Hyperloop Transportation Technologies, and they actually compete with each other. It's the weirdest thing. So just beware. There's okay. multiple Hyperloop no because uh, Elon open sourced it, and right. so everybody said, oh, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. So there's many different groups working on it. So I was talking to HTT, um, Hyperloop Transportation Technologies, and they want to uh, they want to provide high speed rail in the United States, and so they're setting up a test track in California um, to to do that. So. Whether or not that can be done is a, is a pretty significant challenge because they have to put these pylons in all these different uh, agricultural areas and city areas. That's pretty expensive. Sure, and and it's really economically it's hard to make a train work uh, financially. You know, like the you would think ninety two people a minute arrive in Las Vegas, right? And they can't get their monorail system to make sense. Financially. Well, they don't want a monorail system because they want well, the taxi cartel. Yeah, but now all of a sudden you have people at Uber rides, and you can just you can be there in a minute. Yeah, you know, already better than cabs. So it makes that bridge to getting to the monorail system, if they all got on board with it, it makes it that much further away. What about an existing infrastructure on in the East Coast cities like Chicago? You don't need a car in Chicago right now. With but the L? You yeah. have to maintain the L. Or New York. Right, or New York. Or uh, look at the metro just uh, broke down in D.C. and it just, it caused havoc. You know, it's when those systems go down, the billions of dollars you have to spend maintaining this gigantic infrastructure system two-part question how do we get people out of that mindset and into this shared locomotion environment and two is that is it better to is it better to maintain one giant system that already exists or is it better to innovate and have a million little small systems that have to be maintained so i love this discussion i mean essentially we're hammering out centralized versus distributed right right Technology is pushing towards distributed and using existing assets that already exist. So the collaborative economy like Uber, Airbnb is finding resources that are already around you, Mm -hmm. local Mm -hmm. resources and using your phone and finding these things around you. You can quickly access them. They're faster and sometimes cheaper, too. So that's just tapping into what's already around us. And and that is a form of um, redundancy and resiliency. So, for example, when the BART, which is the subway system in, in San Francisco, went down about two years ago due to strikes, we saw a massive increase of Uber and Lyft and at the time sidecar downloads and usage. Mm -hmm. So the the crowd was turning to each other when centralized systems failed. Mm -hmm. And that's one trend that we see in technology. People turn to each other to get what they need using tech. Yeah, I think that's a common theme in the whole collaborative economy that you talk about is people turning to each other when the corporations or industry isn't servicing their needs. And I think this is just another example is the demand is coming from the crowd and the, the need from the crowd versus uh-huh. the creation of a new demand with these uh, high-speed services that are in the process of getting built. That's right. I just came up with the billion-dollar idea. I'm going to call it did. Boober. It's Boat Uber. <laughs> and uh, you go to the it's shore, what? Boober, Boat Uber, and boat you go Uber, to the shore okay. and some dude has got a boat. It's like, yeah, I'll take you across. And it's like the old ferryman, but now you got you just do it with your boat, with your hand, you know, and you, a boat shows up. And now you don't got to pay for the bridge. You don't got to wait on the ferry. You just go across. 15-minute ride, no bridge needed. How about that? <laughs> the boober. I think you're onto something. Yes. I think you might need to work on the branding, though, but it, I, this yes. idea is solid. Hey, Sandra just, can help you with that. I can yes. help you with that, Pete. <laughs> we might have to do a little brainstorming on that name. <laughs> I thought it was genius. <laughs> Maybe we could go to the crowd. <laughs> yeah, we could go <laughs> to, the crowd. to the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I guess sort of switching gears a little bit, that you've got these new emerging trends and you're helping uh, these companies, Fortune 100 companies, take advantage of these new emerging trends. But what are some of the roadblocks that these companies encounter along the way when they're trying to create innovation? The, the biggest problem for these big companies is not external. It's internal. Mm-hmm. They really step on each other and they fight each other. Almost all the conflicts come from within. Mm-hmm. Um, internal stakeholders battling and, well they're, they're generating revenues from their existing product so one group the product managers and that team is the, the regular product they don't want to fight this movement uh, because it's um, and they don't want to join this movement because they're already generating generating revenues and they're held accountable
accountable to quarterly earnings. Mm-hmm. Right, and ultimately it's cannibalizing those other existing That's right. product lines. So the companies have to set up a group for innovation to invest in one year, two year, three year, four year, 10 year, 20 year bets. And a lot of those bets will not pay off. The chances of success are very low. So it's very hard for corporations to want to do this. Uh, let's talk about Nestle, who I think is doing a great job. They set up, an, they're from Switzerland, obviously, mm-hmm. and they set up um, an innovation outpost in San Francisco and they have put tens of millions of dollars towards 30 projects that they're kicking off. Uh, many of them will not be wild successes, but they're anticipating about 10%. Well, it's kind of like start investing in startups almost. It, it totally is. Mentality into innovation. But willing to take risk. Mm-hmm. And, and that's part of what it's like to, to make sure that you maintain your longevity decades out as you have to place bets in innovation now. And so they're doing that, and they set up a a team, and they're working with startups, and they're building their own versions as well, all these different projects. And even if a project doesn't win, they're going to, or quote-unquote, succeed, they will still think of it as a win because of the learnings that they will get from this, and they can apply it forward. And so that's a big step forward for the world's largest food brand in the world to take on. Has anything come out of the outpost yet? This is just, uh, they actually have done a few small things, but this is like the big push now, and they have a lot of executive support. So we can watch that story. I've, I've seen more of this too. We actually had uh, just last week, maybe the week before that, we had Sarah Kuntz on and she's got a startup based on fitness and, and getting athletes to do it's a workout. Pro with day. You. Yeah, Pro Day. And it's awesome. So cool. who's one of the venture capitalists in that? Well, it's the Dodgers. And they're seeing the oh, market of like, we're not just going to sell baseball. We're going to get into this sports space, but be ahead of the game and in investing in these other ideas. And going back to what you said a little while ago, and I find the same thing true. In, I spend more time looking internally at problems within the company because sales is a tribe, marketing is a tribe. All these, they're all different tribes, and they don't all have. They all want the same thing, but they all have different ways of getting there. And a lot of times, they don't. They're not congruent. You take this opportunity. They don't, they to, don't always want the same thing. By right. yeah, 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 yeah. So they don't. Yeah, they don't always want the same thing. The. Um, the idea of investing in startups also takes you out of the internal paradigm and you can have someone else say, Hey, we're going to look, do your own thing outside of this in this arena. And now you can pick and choose what you have. You don't have to serve the internal master, the, the bottom line master and all these other requirements that deny innovation. I mean, Kodak needed to innovate badly. And if they could have got ahead of things, Maybe they survive, you know, in, a, in an actual modern, useful form. Microsoft invested in web TV, which became something totally different. And I don't even know if they ever made any money on it, but they were constantly making those bets. So it's, I think it's beautiful to be able to be outside of that space, investing in people who are external so that they can bring more revenue to you and to that person. Right. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, well, you know, I, I, I came from a background uh, working in the innovation space and we were, um, and enab- had a platform that actually enabled the innovation process end to end, but it was either going externally to customers or internally to your in- own employee base, right. I- employee base and crowdsourcing those ideas. So do you have any examples of those kinds of innovation that um, you've seen success from some of the companies that you've worked with? Yeah, I just published a post on the different ways companies are doing innovation. And you guys could just Google that t- uh, 10 ways companies are doing innovation. And there, one, one of the ways internally with your own employees, we see entrepreneurship programs. Mm-hmm. So instead of... Um, entrepreneur intra which is your own employees so adobe's done something really great they have a program called kickbox and you do a small training class for a few hours and they give you this shoe box it's called the kickbox and inside of it is um recommendations on how to build your own little mini startup inside of adobe as a full-time employee and they give you credit card with a thousand dollars on it and they say there's no rules just go and get proof of concept and then we'll teach you how to sell it up to your boss off you go you don't need to report back mm. to us there's no approval process that's amazing just go Just innovate. And so lots of products have come out of that and they use a thousand dollars to build like a prototype, mock it up. And they do a test case with customers to say, do you prefer this interface or this interface or whatever it is? And just enough to get some numbers, some early traction, and then they can sell it up. So that's an example of entrepreneurship, enabling your own employees uh, to try to do something. I think ultimately the common theme here is that you've got that buy-in from the top, right? The C-suite is saying innovation is it's okay to experiment it's okay to make mistakes uh and and you have to be able to 
have a culture that makes mistakes. So last week I was a speaker at, at a Facebook event. And when you go to their campus, there's posters on the walls that say things like fail fast, fail for just freaking fail. Or, you know, the successes to those who dare. Like lots of things that encourage you to make mistakes. Now, when you go to a traditional corporation where I spend time, on the wall you say, you see things that say 73 days, no accidents. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it's the low. complete opposite <laughs> posters, right? Don't make mistakes. Stay in line. Do your job. Shut up. So it's two different cultures on the mindset. And you saw the earnings of Facebook last week. They're blowing it out of the water. I love the things that you say mimic so much what I do. Like if I go into an internal, like any kind of company, whether it's military based or not, I look on the walls. I see how they communicate with themselves. And you're right. Like you're trying to achieve this effect. Look what your walls are saying. Do you encourage risk or not? That's really what sure. it's come, what the posters are, are trying. You, what's your message? Here's your message that I see coming in as an outsider. And they often, they're like, oh my God, we never realized that. You know, so it's, that's, I love hearing that, that they're starting to make those changes and you're able to go in and give some vision on that area. I, I wouldn't say I give any vision to Facebook, but uh, I'm observing what they're doing. You mm-hmm. know, you're going to talk about these things and that message is going to see into the, uh, into the ecosystem of all these companies. I'd love to talk maybe about some of the ethical quandaries that some of this autonomous and AI technology is going to get us into that, you know, maybe the mainstream consumer isn't thinking about that maybe they should be. I mean, for me, for example, I'm thinking about, okay, well, I cannot wait till I get into my autonomous vehicle, by the way. And, (laughs) but then it's going to be tracking my whereabouts and it's going to know that I go to the gym at six o'clock and then I go to Whole Foods and then this, that, the other. And, and I don't know if I feel comfortable with, well, the companies, (laughs) the companies that are enabling you to do those things already know now. They already know. So with your phone, they already know. And, and your telecom at home already knows a ton about you and our government already knows a ton. It's, it's it's just give up on privacy. You know, I don't say give up. I mean, you still have control. So here's here's the levers. If you give more information up, you get more convenience. Mm-hmm. If you give less information, you get less convenience. It, it, it's yours to play uh, on how you want to live your life. But most people. So when I was a I was a forestry analyst, which is a research firm, and we polled people. This was in the, the height of concern over privacy and social networks um, about eight years ago. And we, and we noticed there's a lot of talk about people who are very concerned about how much information does Mark Zuckerberg know? How much does Google know? And so we polled people, how concerned are you about your online privacy? And people said, very, very concerned. <laughs> and then the next question we said, how many of you have actually read your terms of service? And it's like less than one single digits. And then how many of you have actually gone to your privacy settings and adjusted them less than single digits? Yeah. People say they're very concerned, but they really don't do much about it. Mm-hmm. I totally agree with that statement. One of the things I do is I sit on a board where we talk about pedestrian issues. It's a county. That's a county committee. And the thought is, is that people are concerned about safety when they walk. But when I go out and talk to people, I'll say, what are you concerned about? And, and they'll say safety. <clears throat> but when you ask the next question, okay, well, where's the dangerous place? And they'll say a, a given intersection, that intersection, it's crazy. It's dangerous there. How many accidents do you know of happening there? And they think, and now this is when you have them, right? Now they're thinking, they go, oh. It's just a busy intersection. They're like, yeah, you know what? None. Like, so what really matters? And they're like, honestly, I like it to be beautiful. I like to have my friends there with me when I walk. That's what gets me to walk. It's not this pre-programmed, I will walk to work process that the engineers think about. And God bless the engineers. I, I want them to do their jobs. But they're thinking about convenience. What's uphill? What's down? What am I going to carry? All these other things. And they'll say safety. But really, when the, when the rubber and the road meet, it's not safety. It's, it's the pleasure of the walking experience that matters the most. Interesting. Yeah. That's a good parallel. So, so if it's not privacy then, and or safety, what what are the concerns, the ethical concerns that we need to be thinking about now? And this one is above my head. I, I'm definitely not an expert in this. Is when the robots are and the artificial intelligence systems are able to self build and self heal yes. and learn from each other and become mm-hmm. smarter than humans, which will happen. It will. Yeah. How will they treat humans? And there was um, somebody in the, from the space, and I forget who said it, said they the, these robots will analyze how we've treated animals, mm. and they will treat us the same way we treat animals. <laughs> and we'll either be treated in the following ways. We'll either be vermin, we'll be pets, we'll be food, <laughs> or we'll be observed like birds. Did you just say robots are going to eat us? <laughs> So that's um, that's the practical analysis of how a, a logical robot will say, well, how do they treat 
the other species. Wow. So how, how do you guys how do you guys other? treat animals? <laughs> That's crazy. There's, so that's the ethical. I'm not vegan, so. <laughs> so that's the whole ethical yeah. qu- question because they will be super, more superior or than us. So making process when there is an accident that's about to happen. How does the robot decide? Okay, so that's yeah, that's a, a more near term thing, yeah. and that's being programmed now. Is uh, who who dies right? Yeah. And and you can I've heard Google talk about it, I've heard Tesla talk about this. They all have different answers where they're just trying to maximize safety. And it, it actually the interesting thing, Sandra, is it varies by culture. So in Western cultures, the question is, uh, do you save the young kids or the old people? And almost everybody says the young kids. But in other cultures, like Asian cultures, the older people are valued more because they have wisdom and experience. Wow. So yeah. it actually varies. Um, so, so the ethical programming for a morality programming will vary. Mm-hmm. Or the owner or the crowd, right? Yes, that too. Mm-hmm. Now, is that, I know you said in Asian cultures, but like if you were in Kazakhstan, is that still the same too? Like, do you have to have a cultural wiring put into the programming? Because who knows in different areas what they value, especially in areas that are conflicted, where death just means a different thing than it means to stable countries, you know, where life is, yeah, life's important, but people die around here. You know, and that's part of our life. How do you how do you even begin to understand how to create a, a consumable safety product? Like that's that's challenging. With, with that said, the amount of deaths that have occurred from self driving cars has been one. Sure. After millions of millions of miles driven, and and there's so many deaths from human operated cars. So yeah, fifty thousand a year in the U.S. It, so is the future that the accident rate is going to go down? That is what's been predicted, and so the insurance companies that I, I work with are concerned. This could oh. wipe out auto insurance as we know it, huh. uh, because you're not going to the cars will be safer than human drivers. So there's lots of ramifications, and even ambulances and hospitals. They will have less patience for first responders from auto accidents. There's a lot of um, implications just from self-driving cars. There's also going to be a lot of automation in the hospital that's going to take out subjective opinion and put in actual, you know, using pattern analysis and those kind of things to heal more people more effectively. Uh, yeah, I haven't studied that, so I, yeah. I'm but not I mean, sure it's going to definitely affect insurance and how insurance operates for sure. We're going to be living longer. There's going to be more of us. Those are all. I'm getting uh, hungry very already things. thinking about that. <laughs> more people. Yeah. Yes. So lots of changes as automation and technology improve. Human life will get better, but there will be a lot more people here. So these things also need to provide resources to us. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to the uh, next economy conference, which is Tim O'Reilly's conference in September. And um, that's actually the theme of that event. And so I'm writing up a post about the topics that they should broach. So these are the types the of things. The, it's called the next economy. So they're looking at the combination of technology plus society mm. and the economics. And these topics that we're talking about here today, wow. that's going to be the major cool. um, discussion at the Riley event. And that'll be at the Palace in San Francisco. Oh, so I'm really looking forward to that event. That's cool. That sounds amazing. Yeah. For me, um, since I've known you for so long and yeah. I've kind of seen your rise and, you know, seen you turn into this incredible public speaker and the CEO and forefront of your company, I guess I'm curious what advice you would give to your younger self now looking back. Oh, gosh. I mean, there's a, a lot of lessons on, on management and leadership that I've learned on, on how to hire people and having a clear business model. I think the one thing that I've done in my career is I've always gotten in front of the next parade. So I can't take credit for the technology engineering that these amazing companies have done. I just got in front of it and helped to explain it to the companies that need to understand it, these big companies. And this is actually a quote I I learned from Tara Hunt. You know Tara, right? Um, I know her name. Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. And so I... um, she said long time ago, just get in front of a parade and identify the trends that are coming and then try to make it easy for other people to understand. And you guys are doing that right here on this podcast yeah. too. So uh, one and the same. So get in front of that parade. And today this parade we're talking about is automation is coming very fast. So get in front of it now. Get in front of it. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's a, that's a good human space for making money because you can be a company that innovates so fast no one can keep up with you and you need some guides in between you and that innovation and that's that's a great space that's hard to automate that's right cool I appreciate your time man thank, thank you. you guys for having me that thank was a real joy thank you so much thank you it's been awesome